very much. So actually, I wanted to uh, say the topic because it's a really long one, and it, I think it's way too difficult to explain what we do. So um, who has heard of UNGGIM Europe in the room? Can you? OK. So basically all of them. <laughs> that's, that's a good start today. OK, so what, what, what are we doing at UNGGM Europe and especially in the working groups? So we want to combine statistical and geospatial data. I've been to a few sessions the last two days and I've heard a lot of combining data and especially statistical data and geospatial data. But sometimes it's like not really practical. So why, why, why do we need that? Why do we need to combine this data? And I really like this, um, the presentation in the morning today, which was held by um, Hannes Reuter. And he said, okay, we need that because we want to have a 2021 census where we want to combine the data together and we want to have maps of statistics. And that's really the reason why we're doing it. And the second reason is because we have the sustainable development goals and I think, oh, I hope everyone heard of it already in the room. So the United Nations have new sustainable development goals and to reach these goals we have to put statistical and geospatial data together to have new findings and new outcomes and to see how it's working. So, quick introductions. How are we doing that? So we have a working group within UNGGM Europe and this working group is really on data integration. It's one of the working groups. We have another one on core data, which is uh, Dominique is presenting after my presentation. So we, you will hear about that too. But at first we want to start about uh, um, working group on data integration. So what are we doing there? Really easy to say, we have two tasks. And one task is the policy outreach paper. So what is the policy outreach paper? I would say, yeah, we heard a lot of technical components, how to um, combine these data, but we also need the formal ones. We need to have a letter, we need to have some papers about how can we combine this data and what are the recommendations on combining this data. We want to promote the benefits to the uh, public and to the ministry and all the people. So that's why we're doing a policy outreach paper. And the second one, what's the second task? Also really easy, we have the sustainable development goals. We want to um, have indicators, we want to, to measure them. And before we can measure them, we have to, to look at the data, what kind of data do we have and can we meet all the sustainable development goals in the future. So that's the two tasks. Again, the first task I'm basically working on is the policy outreach paper. We want to have recommendations um, on how you can improve data integration and also want to address the challenges we're facing in data integration topics. Um, who is it for? The main users will be the senior manager at the National Statistical Institute and the National Mapping Agency. But these people are all people who are related to geospatial data or even have, like, they heard from it. They're not new to the topic. So, and it will be hopefully not that long document, but it will be a lot of written text in it. And, um, yeah, we want to address them, but that's not the only thing we want to do. We have a lot of people who never heard of um, geospatial data and combining data and data integration. That's why we do another thing, and that's called the leaflet supporting the policy outreach paper. We want to um, also address policymakers who never heard of geospatial data or are not related to that. Like, um, how can you... How can you imagine this will happen? This will happen. So right now, in the working group, we're working on um, several leaflets, and we want to to talk about how data integration was done in the past. So we have a really nice example from the Netherlands. Um, I think it was last year or two years ago when the hurricane in the Caribbean striked, Saint Martin, and everything was destroyed, uh, and there. I think probably the first time data integration was really done well because we had, um, or they had like satellite images, topographic maps, and they had real data which they can give to the Red Cross and to the public and they can get the help where it was needed. So that's a really nice example of data integration. Also in Germany we have a nice example. Um, we did a work 
with our statistical institute where we um, try to look at um, households and how these households um, uh, are spatially distributed concerning schools. So we wanted to see how long is the school, um, I don't know the English word, I'm sorry. Um, entfernt? Oh, yeah, how long, sorry, how long is the distance to the school? So that's another one. So um, these are the topics we talk about in the leaflets, just to gain some imagination on data integrations to people who never related to it. Also, as we were writing the policy paper, it's kind of, right now it's a draft, so it's not finished, but we were writing some recommendations and some um, text, but we realized, oh, we didn't know that much about um, some issues and problems within the countries. So another thing we did was a questionnaire, and we just did the questionnaire, the deadline was end of August, and we um, sent it out to 180 UN GGM members and UN ECE members, and um, I yeah, wanted to gain some information. So what are the problems in the, in the countries? And we want to, to make measures and want to improve the situation. So right now, another question to you would be, have you received this questionnaire? Or have you heard about this questionnaire? Some of you? Can you raise your hand? OK, perfect. So if you, if, you, if you filled it out already, that's perfect. We're working on it. If not, I will invite you to do it, because as many we can need more data to get a real good um, overview. But again, questionnaire, it's 53 questions, and we have questions about governance and policy, data sources and standards, um, the agenda, methods and technology, and user engagement. Um, just um, to let you know, in the methods and technology, we also ask about linked data and geocoding um, methods. So it's really a good overview over all things happening in the, in the country. It's not just technical, but also formal things. And what is really interesting, we also included some expired topics, and I will show you later. So that's a nice map we already have. We have uh, received 33 questionnaires from 25 countries, which is almost half of the countries we sent to, so it's a really nice um, response. Um, as you can see, we have different colors in the, um, in the map, and that is why, because we got some questionnaires from the National Statistics Institute, we got some questionnaires from the National Mapping Agency, and we got some coordinated responses. So we're figuring out how to evaluate these um, answers, but at least we have answers, and we have good ones, so thank you for that. And now I would like you some um, results of the question already, which I did really fast last week. And um, one of the questions was, do you have an agreement on cooperation between the NSI and the NMCA in your country? And that's really important for us to know, because we want to bring the data together. And to bring the data together, we need to bring the people together. And the good thing is, most of you answered, yes, we do have it. Or um, we are planning to do it. So that's a really good thing. That's really good for us. Another thing is, do you think data integration is making your cooperation more effective and efficient? And surprisingly, most of you said, yeah, it, it makes it more efficient and effective. And we really want that answer, because that's what we want. The last one, do you think your data quality will improve using data integration? And also, it was like, sorry, 92% saying, yeah, it will improve our data. So that's also a good question. So now I will show you some um, the, the questions we did on the Inspire data, which is which themes have been made available according to Inspire regulation in your country. Um, it doesn't look that good, so don't look at that close. Um, the diagram is not really the real situation because you have to um, take into account that we have some answers of the National Statistics Institutes in there and they are not uh, doing the um, transport networks or hydrography. So this uh, result is just, um, just 
the one of last week and I will work on that to make it better and to have the real situation. So most of you have um, made the beta data available of the Annex 1, but this is not the right one. Just to show you how this will look in the end. And then another good one for working group A, the core data. Um, are you aware of the additional recommendations um, provided by UNGGIM Europe on core data? And also, 84 said, yeah, we do. We, we are aware of these uh, recommendations. And then the question after that was, do you think these recommendations are helpful? And most of you answers, answered, yes, they are helpful. They, they, they are really helpful, somewhat helpful, and um, we can work on that. And that's really a good um, Outcome. So the work of the working group A, which Dominique will present later, is really um, paying out. Yeah. So these are some um, first results. We have 53 questions I need to evaluate in the next few weeks. And then when the final report is ready, we have a good situation or good start to do the, the final report or the final policy outreach paper. So, and now... My colleague will present you on the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you, Franka. I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> okay. So it, it seems a little be very fast. Okay. Uh, okay. So as you heard already, there is another task, so-called task two, in the working group on data integration, where we are basically che checking and assessing methodology and data availability for selected indicators. Um, I will skip this one. So basically what we are doing, we started uh, to see, um, investigate global metadata on the selected indicators and uh, where we are trying uh, to analyze, to do some kind of gap analysis and to see how it can be improved, uh, those metadata. Also, we are trying to look at the national practices, uh, current national practices, and all of this will be somehow the input to basically to develop uh, um, some kind of discussion papers on the, on the selected indicators, which then uh, will be in the final, final uh, report uh, of, our, uh, of our work. So this is, I think, very interesting slide. So we choose the, uh, the beginning four uh, indicators, um, uh, 1121, 1131, 1171, and 1511. Um, how we selected them, we wanted uh, to include, let's say, indicators from uh, different tiers. You know that there are tier one, tier two, tier three indicators. And basically what uh, we got from, uh, from as a result from the first analysis from uh, selected countries um, is basically that it corresponds really uh, to the situation. So if you look, uh, the 15.11 uh, indicator is a tier one. Uh, 1121 and 1131 is uh, they are both tier two, and 1171 is tier three. So you can clearly see that uh, it really shows that uh, there are problems still with uh, tier three indicators. Uh, so they are all basically in red. Um, first two, uh, we have some orange and green. So it's a uh, not, not the, the, the same situation in, in all uh, countries, uh, which we took into the analysis. And obviously for the tier one indicator, uh, which is 1511, is the best, let's say, uh, uh, situation. Okay, so Frank again. Yeah, because we're running out of time, it's really easy to sum up all of this. Um, we're just finishing all the work we just uh, presented. So we're finishing the results on a questionnaire, doing a report on it. And we're also finishing the leaflets and we're finishing the outreach paper. So, and then hopefully by end of the year or February, I think it's a new time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and just quickly on the task two. So, we have a meeting next week in Lisbon where we will try to consolidate all the um, indicators and uh, insert into the final report and then provide feedback to respective UN bodies. Thank you very much. Okay, so as time is quick, I... Okay. Uh, it's about core geographic data addressing the requirements of the statistical community, at least we hope so. Uh, there are a lot of statisticians in the room, so maybe they can tell me if we are really addressing their requirements. 
or just imagine in that we are doing so. So a quick reminder about core data for the newcomers. Uh, core data, it's an initiative from UNGGIM Europe. UNGGIM is United Nations Initiative on Global Geographic Information Management. And in the regional initiative in UNGGIM Europe, there is a two working group, one about core data that I am presenting, and one about data integration that was presented previously by Franca and Vlado. And the objective of this working group is to define priorities for production of new data. It's about minimum content. It's not ideal data. It's really minimum uh, common requirements. It may be production of new data, of, of course, enhancement of existing data. Core data has been defined in relation with the sustainable development goals. It's priority data. Uh, it's geospatial data considered as the most useful to analyze, achieve, or monitor the SDG either directly or indirectly. And of course, as we are addressing monitoring the SDG, the statistical community is quite involved in it. So what are the requirements of the statistical community at high level? Uh, how have we got, get aware of these requirements? I will say by very classical means. Uh, the first uh, mean is that we have some, in the core data working group, we are mainly from national mapping and cadastral agencies, but there is one exception, a very precious man from uh, uh, statistics Spain, Ignacio Duque, uh, and we also uh, try to get requirements from bibliography, from questionnaire, from joint meeting, for in instance, we invited some statistical members to one of our meetings when selecting the core data themes, uh, we invite also the, community, uh, the statistical community to review our deliverables. So with all these very classical means, we hope we understand the requirements of the statistical community. So in general, really, this UNGGIM activities has been a wonderful opportunity uh, to make the two communities, geospatial and statistical, closer uh, one from one another. So the main requirements at high level, uh, there is need to use uh, geospatial data by statistical community, first to capture, to reference statistical information, as uh, seen in the global uh, statistical geospatial framework, uh, to, have common, to have fundamental geospatial infrastructure and geocoding. It's also to compute some indicators and also to display statistical results on maps, all kinds of maps, as shown also in the uh, global uh, framework, common geographic for dissemination of statistics. How, at least it's our understanding of the statistical requirements. Let us see them more in detail. So the first one is about capturing uh, or georeferencing statistical data. Capturing statistical data, for instance, during census, uh, the previous practice was to capture an administrative unit, but it was not very detailed, and there were temporal change, uh, whereas statisticians are very fond of uh, very long rows of data on fixed geometries uh, to identify trends and evolution. So there has been a current, there is a current trend that is to capture statistical data on a point-based geospatial framework with three candidate themes, address, cadastral parcel, and building, to enable the aggregation on any kind of geometries and to get rid of the change in administrative unit. So how are we addressing these requirements? What is the core data answer? The first one is that we have selected the candidate themes as core data themes. And we, uh, we built on, mainly on inspired data specification, but we have added recommendations for content and for quality, uh, mainly regarding completeness. For instance, we are pushing to have cadastral parcel on whole land territory, including public domain, and also pushing the creation of true addresses everywhere, including in rural areas. 
typically, uh, at least in France, in uh, small villages, uh, the address is just the village name. There are no street name, no house number, so many families share the same address. It's not a true address. So we would like to, to push, to encourage, to have two addresses everywhere. Another requirement is to have geocoding of statistical data. For instance, a textual file with indirect geometry, such as an address, and then a geocoding service uh, using geospatial data, using some kind of geographic identifier, and enabling to find direct geometry with coordinates, and so to display uh, things on a map. What is the core data answer? We have selected the themes that include geographic identifiers, such as administrative units, geographical names, address. And we are, once again, recommendation for content, of course, based on INSPI, but adding quality requirement on completeness, as I said previously, but also on semantic reliability, for instance, uh, asking people to take care of, in the spelling of geographical name, in the spelling of street name, because if the spelling is not correct, there will be poor matching uh, between the textual files and the geographic data. And what would be even better is to have reference data for all the files in one country, to have uh, all public bodies using same uh, reference data. Another answer, it's about uh, the content. Uh, we understood that there, uh, there is big interest for postal uh, code geometry, so we are dis discussing if we could uh, extend the inspired data model to, to add the geometry of the, of the postal uh, zone in the, in the data, because it's of interest as some uh, statistical data, uh, it's a geographic identifier. In fact, the postal code is a geographic identifier. Uh, there, there is another requirement from uh, the statistical community. It's, of course, addresses from the past, because, for instance, uh, companies may be registered with addresses that are 10 years, 15 years ago. Uh, it's of interest, but we have not considered it as priority because we have to take also into account feasibility issues. So we think that uh, the priority is still on today's uh, data. Data of the past is of interest, but maybe not so core, not so priority. Computing indicators. I don't think we are aware of all indicators that are required by the statistical community, but at least we focus on the SDG-related one. As you can see, uh, there is a list of uh, indicators consuming geographic information. In our uh, understanding, uh, the, the answer is that uh, we have selected the themes that look the most relevant uh, for these indicators. Uh, the main indicators are related to accessibility, so we have selected uh, the ones that may be used, for instance, building, because it's where people are. Uh, for instance, basic services, because several SDG targets are related to accessibility to schools, accessibility to hospitals, accessibility to basic services. And to make it accessible, of course, you need transport. So transport network was also selected. And the other kind of indicators, it's about specific areas and their protection. For instance, to know it's a forest with land cover and uh, to know it's protected with protected sites, area management. Uh, so it's the theme we have selected. And we, are, we have also some recommendations for content, for instance, about completeness, about uh, uh, priority scope for the uh, management areas that are the most useful for the SDG. Two minutes, it's fine. Displaying statistical data. Uh, of course, we need uh, statistical units, uh, but... Uh, there may be different characteristics. For instance, uh, of course, there is need for detailed information, but you have to respect also privacy rules. Uh, persistent geometries are of interest. Well-known geometries are of interest. 
relevant geographic coverage, for instance, uh, for some data, uh, would territory is needed, for other, only urban areas are useful. And it may be also useful to have facilitated to facilitate the comparison to have, for instance, statistical units of same area or of similar population range. So, of course, there is no uh, statistical unit uh, respecting all these characteristics. It's why uh, there is need for several kinds of statistical units. So it was one of the things we discussed more. It was uh, which, which are the core statistical units. And the answer was uh, grid, mainly the one square kilometer grid that was a success in the Geostat project, but also terrestrial units for statistics, which are based on administrative units, so they are well known, widely used, urban units for urban specific phenomena, an enumeration district because uh, it's the most detailed uh, geography available uh, to display statistics. And we have also added recommendation on temporal aspects because it seems of great interest for the statistical community. So as a conclusion, I will say uh, core data aims to uh, analyze, achieve, and monitor the SDG. It's because of this monitoring role, we have taken great care of the statistical community, but not only, there are other requirements, and I will say even more important than monitoring the SDG, the most important is to achieve them. And we have also uh, uh, taking in mind that it's about priority. So we don't pretend to have integrated all the requirements of the statistical community because we have to take uh, into consideration feasibility issues, cost and benefits. So we take care of the statistical community, but in general, we are driven mainly uh, by the SDG uh, and the statistical community is w one of the users. It's a big user, it's a practical user because we have a lot of interrelation, but it's only one of the users. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. One or two questions, please, from the audience. Thank you very much. I would like to ask, um, do you also look into uh, the marine part of, uh, of, of the SDGs, like SDG 14 on the oceans? And reporting on, on, on the seas in Europe is, uh, is also uh, a big thing. Uh, partly. Uh, we, we have some themes that, are big, uh, that may concern land and sea. For instance, we have elevation. Uh, we have also area management. So all these uh, uh, regulated areas that are on sea uh, should be included in core data. Uh, but I will say we are focused, nevertheless, more on land than on sea. Okay, let's talk about um, why this session is called Merging Statistics and Geoinformation. Um, we're running from Eurostat's side uh, an action, an European statistical system, ESS action since seven years, where we have on an individual member state level financing actions by the member states where they can combine statistics and geo information. Uh, and I want to review it a little bit and show you, showcase what are the outcomes. And before that one, just want to mention one thing. If you're at our European Commission stand downstairs, uh, you can, some of the outcomes out of these grants uh, or from Eurostat uh, actually came into the Urban Europe publication or the Euros Eurostat regional yearbook. If you want to take it home, there's a couple of copies downstairs uh, for you to take home if you want, just to gi give you a little bit more paper in your uh, f flight back. So coming back to seven years of member states working on merging statistics and geo-information, um, I think you all know about Eurostat. Is that true? Everybody has been there? Everybody has seen the office? No? Yes? Maybe? Uh, so I just skipped that one. I just went, if you ever come to beautiful Luxembourg, please drop by in our beautiful um, shopping mall building uh, of the European Commission. 
Um, um, just want to mention how do we work as a European statistical system. Um, we work together uh, with our national statistical authorities. Some of them are in the room today here, and we actually collect data from them, process them, and distribute them at the European level. I mean, this is how it works. Uh, and now, if we're talking about the grants and the review of the grants, uh, we are identified eight, nine years ago, and I see Daniel Ritz is sitting back there. Uh, he was, back then, he was working with the DISCO team. Uh, they wrote back then this kind of uh, question, uh, uh, how should we address the demand that there was an issue about merging st merger information on um, statistics, and there was missing link between these two. So the question was, how can we promote this one? So the use of geospatial information for statistical purposes. And how can we progress on that one? And there were two actions funded back then. So one is the already mentioned uh, early on, the Geostat 123. Several people have contributed to that one. And then we have the Emerging Statistics and Geoinformation Action, uh, where we focus more on financing individual member states, individual national statistics institutes, together with national mapping and cartographic agencies. So I just will show you one example from Geostat uh, 1, 2, 3, maybe 4, and then a couple of selected examples for the Emerging Statistics and Geoinformation Grant. So if you, we're looking at Geostat and uh, we're looking back to 2010, um, there I think one of the biggest su successes from statistics and also uh, other communities, statistics, national mapping agencies, is that we created a population grid for all over Europe on one kilometer data sets, uh, so which you see down there, uh, which you can download at Eurostat webpage. Uh, even uh, in a viewer, visualize it, you see it at the EFGS website. Um, then it, this was fo followed by Geostat 2, which brought in the point-based uh, geocoding infrastructure, uh, and then Geostat 3, which is currently ongoing. And you have seen the pyramid just in the last presentation. I just want to point out here there are links again between statistics and national mapping agencies. So, and this goes again towards SDG. So if you want to see that, uh, I can invite you, just Google Eurostat Statistical Atlas, and you can uh, find it uh, there. And we have just released the U uh, um, yearbook 2018 with all the best and ever statistical data of Europe from the last couple of years. and. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, the print did not make it to the Inspire conference, but from last year, you can see that here. Enough about promotional. Now I'm going to actually the merging statistics and geoinformation grants. I have an issue here, which is you see how many grants we have from many different member states, and I just have not sufficient time to present you all the results. So it's a choice made by me who I present today, and you will have two more uh, presentations, actually three more presentations by national statistical institutes, what they're really doing in their member states, sometimes financed by us, sometimes not financed by us. So I just had to issue who do I select, and I just put you some of them, which I think is a reoccurring theme in all our work from a European Commission perspective. So what are issues? What are issues in the member states? Addresses, address databases. So, in some of our national statistical institutes, we have 20 different address databases in different statistical domains. Uh, this is an issue which has been addressed in many of them, so they're converging. So this is something, but it's a reoccurring theme, and we just need to acknowledge that one. Uh, reoccurring themes is how do we visualize our statistical data? How do we visualize all these kind of things, bring it back to our users? What are, uh, we want to work on grids. Uh, yeah, I just showed you the population grid. What can we do further doing with grids? And we will see afterwards, I think, a nice presentation by Peter on that one. SDGs is also an, seem, seem to be addressed. And while we have seen these four topics occurring, occurring over and over again in all the different grants, we also had some leading, I don't want to call them cutting edge, uh, on mobile phone usage. Uh, I will show you an example on linked open data, and now we see more and more people looking into what they can do actually with Earth observation, coming back to Copernicus, 
So what can they do with uh, Earth observation with satellite data for SDGs, for example, for detecting uh, solar cells in the Netherlands or for looking into agriculture statistics? So coming back to reoccurring themes, addresses. Why do we need addresses? I mean, addresses we need to, for example, the Greek colleagues took the addresses and digitized manually, digitized their settlement boundaries. So they got finally the settlement boundaries of 12,000 settlements settled down, so they could connect actually their statistical data with their geograph geography, and they could make the geostat grid, and they could look what is the reality with some uh, downscale data. So here is, for example, a nice example from Crete. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in Greece this summer and maybe have been on Crete, and then you can see how nicely it's distributed there on a one kilometer grid. And this has not only been in Greece, I just chose Greece here as one example. We have seen it over and over again. Standard work in the member states where they improved their workflows, where they improved their data processing or even their connection processes to uh, the national mapping agencies. Um, I just want to go over to something uh, really um, leading edge or cutting edge. Back then in 2013, Slovenia actually worked on mobile phone data. And I always will, um, 2013, not many people were talking about how do we use mobile phone data for statistics. I mean, now it's like, well, we can do that. Uh, but I mean, 2013, it was barely everyone. So Statistics Slovenia worked on that one. I will always remember uh, Igor Kutma's comment on what is the fastest ever observed observation for cell phones in Slovenia, in Slovenia was 800 kilometer per hour. So someone flying over apparently and got still locked in the system. So I mean, there's all kinds of issue out of that one. This is something really interesting. So they talked about accuracy, what you can measure with that one. Nowadays, it's all knowledge and they worked on it quite recently and they made nice maps because if you have cell phone data and you have the really measurement down to the, to the um, mes message level, they actually worked on the message level, you can make these kind of maps like um, what's the population at 1700 and measured by a mobile phone data and mobile phone, I'm sorry, is just a proxy for real population. But just to show you an example. Slovenia also, I just picked Slovenia here again, they were also quite advanced with uh, visualization, with map visualization. They developed Stage, which is now even open source. And from one, uh, let's say, viewer visualization, I go to the other side of Europe, I go to Finland. Because in Finland, we had the second NSI together with the National Mapping Agency, which really worked closely together to bring up visualizations. Uh, you see, for example, Statistics Finland data directly in their uh, national land survey portal to be visualized uh, in there. So this is something really nice uh, where we see integration of both of them working together. And um, um, yes, and one thing which I want to point out, which is not really, it's maybe hidden more hidden under the surface. Uh, all these grants usually created Inspire services out of that one. So somewhere in the end, there were something Inspire WMS, Inspire WFS uh, created for in, in some of them. And this is something really nice, which I'm, I'm, I'm considering why we are also running this session here, where we're merging statistics and geo-information and we're fulfilling Inspire requirements. So if you look at, for example, Finnish data, how many people, number of requests, of service requests uh, are taken out, this is quite impressive, I would say so. So um, now coming back from data processing, visualization, down to analytical tasks. And I think here I'm starting with Finland, uh, where they looked at commuting. So they commuted and they figured out the median for time for commuting if you drive by car or if you drive by bicycle. And they, for that one, they only use the road network and they even use the traffic road sensors so it even goes into the direction of big data. So, I mean, this is something really interesting, at least from my perspective as a European Commission official, to see that in an individual member state to be implemented. And similar to that one, we have seen grid-based indicators in Austria where the colleagues have taken similar approaches and doing massive computations 
to see the accessibility. So this is total accessibility of one kilometer grid cell by people where, where they're living and how they can reach certain things. So this is total accessibility. It's a mix out of several indicators. Here we see, for example, accessibility by education. So how much time, uh, what's the distance until I reach I need my next education uh, facility, the next school, the next university, something like that, or the police station. And you can all that combine that, and then you can uh, do policy analysis, analysis on top of that one. So coming back from grid-based, uh, just want to jump a little bit further down from Austria to Croatia, uh, where the colleagues have actually taken the first time, and thanks to all the work which we had seen here early on on UNGDM core data on the Geostat project, where they actually use geocoding together with the National Mapping Cartographic Agency, geocode all their businesses. So they made maps where they show tertiary sector businesses or something like um, administration and defense offices in, on a one kilometer grid. I mean, the, the ideas or the analytical tasks are endless. I mean, I'm really impressed what people are, the mindsets of people in Europe which are applying and merging statistics and geo information. And the similar goes to Latvia, if we're going to the other one. They, for example, used OCR to get old data from 2000 back into the IT system, then to analyze this, um, what's the share of unemployed persons, sorry, is it unemployed persons, yeah, um, in 2000, in 2011. So how did that change? So I go back, you see, how did that change a little bit over time series so that you can, or where actually do we see depopulation in the country or where we see an increase in the population? So, and last but not least, here we go to Statistics Netherlands. Uh, in one of the last sessions we have seen now, a table joint service from our Finnish colleagues. I think uh, Statistics Netherlands has worked quite intensively, intensively on that with uh, colleagues from GeoNovum, Geo, PDO, PDO, and all that, on that one. So I think this is giving you, in a nutshell, and sorry, I was racing through the slides, uh, what we have done in the last couple of years. Um, if I want to review it, I would say it was a success. Because maybe not intentionally or maybe intentionally, what we achieved is that national statistical institutes and national mapping agencies are working closer together. They're talking to each other, they are having data agreements, all this kind of organizational setup is in place. We see data sharing, we see visualization popping up everywhere. We observe reoccurring themes like address or geocoding infrastructure sometimes. We see new statistical products appearing, like commuting indicators, nef never, never been there. Uh, other databases, business grids, I just showed you here an example from Croatia, linked open data, and we will have, see, we will have two more presentations on linked data and open data on later on, so I didn't put here more on that one. And we see Inspire services coming out of that one. So I think we are quite successful with our work where we're financing individual member states here uh, and doing that one. And with that one, I'm thanking you and I am, hope I, yes, I'm not too much over on time, just one minute. I allow myself one minute for one minute for one question. Thank you. Amenities. Uh, amenities are all kinds of services uh, like schools, train stations, or police offices, or hospitals, anything that you, you can think of. Um, and we have a problem with that, because so far we only calculate these distances uh, until the border. We don't take in account the uh, amenities in foreign countries. So, for instance, here we have the distance to a railway station. Uh, and you see, uh, the closer you come to Belgium, the more red it becomes. So, it looks as if these poor people can never take a train. But we all know uh, <coughs> we are here in Antwerp, and uh, there's really a very close a railway station. So, these statistics don't make sense at the border. So what we want to do is uh, get all the Inspire data and calculate uh, these distances also across the border. 
Um, so I am uh, uh, going to tell uh, how this works, this calculation of this, uh, these proximities to these amenities. Then uh, I, I'm going to tell about my search for inspired data for this uh, use case. And finally, I come with some conclusions. So first, uh, the, the production process of proximity statistics in the Netherlands. Uh, we calculate these distances uh, across the road. Uh, and we do that both for uh, roads for cars and also for bicycles. And then for each address in the Netherlands, we calculate the distance to all the uh, amenit amenities. So in this case, we have uh, schools. The yellow dots are schools. And the more red the addresses are, the closer they are to the schools. And you can clearly see, for instance, here, does it work, that these people have to travel a long way to get there. So because here is something they can't pass, like a canal or so. So it's really calculated across the road and not uh, direct distance. So um, to do this, we need addresses and a transport network. And we are lucky. Those are both themes in Annex 1 of Inspire. So we thought, well, this must be able by now because the deadline for Annex 1 is already passed a year ago. So we started. We started to look for the data. And I took this as my research area because this is the part of the Netherlands that sticks most into foreign countries. It's uh, the south of Limburg and it's it's uh, connected to Belgium. Uh, we have uh, a Flemish part of Belgium and a Wallonian part. And we also had the Germans as neighbors. So for these areas, I tried to look for data. And I, I first started the search in the thematic viewer. This is a very good tool. And if you, you can just uh, select the, the Inspire theme and uh, then start selecting for a country, and then you see what kind of data is available. But I noticed not everything that I was looking for was in there. So I also started to look a little bit closer into the local, local uh, uh, catalog services. And I was happy that for all these four regions, there was a local service. So that helped a lot. So here are the results of my research, of looking for the data. And what I hoped it was everything was green. But I'm sorry, it was not. Um, what you see is uh, four big columns, Netherlands, Germany, uh, Flanders, and Wallonia. And I searched the uh, addresses, uh, WFS, atom feeds. I looked for the metadata, and I tried to find out how they appeared in the thematic viewer. And I did the same for the road <coughs> networks. So. Um, well, don't try to look in this detail. You can download the, the presentation later because it's too much. But uh, the, the main thing I want to say is, well, it's clearly not uh, ready yet. And that was uh, a bit of a disappointment for me. And what I also found about the thematic viewer is that it, it was difficult to see if the data that I found, if, whether it was harmonized or not. I mean, I first had to download it and look at the data and then realize, oh, this is not harmonized yet. So this is how I process this work. It took me about uh, eight working days to gather all this information. So. And then, when I found the data, I started to download it. And I did, tried it in three ways. Uh, if there was a WFS, I tried to download it in tools, like QGIS or RTIS. Uh, I try to download it in a browser, and then uh, copy-paste the result into a GML file and try to import that. And I try to import <coughs> using uh, the whole data set as an Atom feed, if available. So my, my experiences with the WFS uh, in the browser were that, uh, first of all, it was very difficult to make selection with a bounding box. Uh, because 
somehow the, the, the coordinates were switched. So you had to download first and see, oh, I get nothing maybe if I switch north, latitude and longitude, and then you get something. But it's, it's frustrating if you have to first find out how, about it. And also, it was not always clear which coordinate system. Sometimes you needed to put the bounding box in projected coordinates and sometimes in that long. Um, also, filtering was a problem because I only wanted the data in this research area, but uh, I could not filter on, uh, on for instance, on, on, on the, the location where this data was. Uh, it's too complex. And what also was frustrating is that many feature services have a maximum uh, to their uh, amount of features that you can download. So mostly it was only 1,000 uh, features, and for addresses that is far too low for our research. Then, um, <coughs> when, I want, when I finally had the data, I wanted to try to use it into tools. Uh, I tried uh, RGIS with a uh, data interoperability extension, and I tried um, QGIS. Uh, and the first thing I realized is that the harmonized data with the complex features, they don't work in these tools. So I, I could not get them inside. There were all kinds of errors. I could sometimes find uh, a plugin for uh, complex features, but still it didn't work for us. So that was uh, a big problem. But uh, downloading the GML files uh, in a browser uh, worked a little bit better. That sometimes gave good results, but still there, there were problems because the, there were strange uh, references to other places on the internet, and then the GML file uh, was not considered proper by the application, so I couldn't continue. Also here again, the bounding box was a problem. I tried to fill in a, a lot of things, but it didn't work in many times. And actually, I had much better results with the, the, the original data, the as-is data. And that is actually what you see here. All I downloaded here are the addresses from our, uh, for my research area, but it's all the original data. It's not the harmonized data. This, so uh, that's a bit of a disappointment because when we want to start uh, make our analysis with this data, we first have to bring it to one data model before we can do that. I did the same for the roads, and uh, I must admit that later on I found out that uh, the roads in Wallonia do exist, but <laughs> I had to zoom in a little bit more and then they appeared. But they were bounded to uh, uh, the, the scale. So this gives a wrong impression. Wallonia does have roads. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, we found out that it did, did not always connect properly. So we can't get from the Netherlands to Germany. We have to jump. Yes. I come to my final conclusions. Uh, harmonized complex features <laughs> They don't work in GIS systems. It's, it's too complex. I think we should look for something more simple. Uh, and uh, you, you really need to be a GIS expert and also have some expertise in OGC uh, standards to be able to download this data. And finally, I, I would like to say that the Retrieving cross-border geodata is still troublesome. Uh, the Annex 1 deadline has not been reached for these themes, but it's much better than 10 years ago, because at least I was able to find all the data. I mean, the, the metadata was there. Um, and I did manage to get it into my system, although it took me a long time. So. It's much better than it used to be, because I think if I had tried to do this 10 years ago, I would not have been able to do it. So thank you for your attention. Peter's.
Do you know which version of QGIS you were using? Um, well, uh, that depends. Uh, at my work, I have 2.18, but at home, I have uh, 3.2. Because at home, it's more easy to update. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe then. Uh... Two different opinions here on, uh, sorry. I believe 3.2 is able to read complex feature types correctly. Okay, well. well the, over there I heard this is not, but I mean, okay, maybe you uh, discuss that later on over yep, coffee. I'm very interested to know where I should look. Okay. Any other points to that one? To the display. Okay, here. Edwin Biegel, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, water Infrastructure and, uh, and Water. <laughs> uh, how did the uh, Inspire community uh, respond to your findings? Uh, well, uh, so far I did not have any response. Yeah, you should uh, bring it to Geonovum and, uh, and then it should be uh, yeah, collected. Because I think it's a, a very uh, a useful uh, experience, mm -hmm. what you did. And maybe we can conclude, make some uh, conclusions for the, for the next period, for the yeah, next maybe, years. Maybe I can give the same presentation at the Dutch uh, uh, well, you boarding yes. uh, meeting yes. for Inspire. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Mirosław Migacz. I work as a GIS consultant in Statistics Poland. So I come from the geographical GIS world and uh, some time ago I embarked on a journey uh, on uh, the linked open data world. And uh, I will tell you a bit about my adventures. Uh, so, uh, as Hannes said, uh, uh, we have a series of grants about merging statistics and geospatial information. This is how our linked open data pilot has been uh, performed under this series of grants. Uh, starting the project, I didn't realize uh, how much more than geospatial information uh, will uh, there be in this project. Some background. What was the main goal of the project? Imagine that uh, we have uh, several databases in official statistics. We have a single uh, statistical or administrative unit for which we want to acquire some data. We ask these databases. Some of them we ask with identifiers, which are uh, numbers. Some, some we ask by alphanumeric characters. Depends on the database. We get our results. Some of them are visible on a computer. Some of them are visible on a map. Uh, and some are in a publication that you can download from our website. And what is the aim of linked open data in our opinion? We have the same databases. We have the same statistical unit. We have a uniform resource identifier, which is a resolvable link in a browser, which we use to access any of the databases. We get our results. They are all visible on the computer. And most importantly, they are all machine readable. So the specific objectives of our project were to identify data sources we have that we can either transform or publish as linked open data, then identify statistical units for which we can present data. Those statistical units we harmonized, generalized, we designed URIs for them, and then all the data that has been gathered for this project, we transformed uh, as a pilot into RDF data and concluded the pilot with some recommendations for a full-on implementation, which we hope to uh, acquire in the following years. Uh, we took uh, to the project uh, three major databases with statistical data that we have. This is the local data bank. Uh, this is our biggest database with lots of statistical data available for a wide range of years. Uh, we also have a demography database with population and vital statistics, and a system for uh, monitoring development according to uh, strategic documents at the local, regional, transregional, and EU level. This is called Stratec. We identified all sorts of da uh, data sources that we have. Those include publications, tables, communiques, announcements, and articles. 
We performed an inventory of all these data sets. Uh, we described them with metadata, including a thematic category, format in which the data is available, their spatial reference, temporal reference, mean, meaning the years for which the data is available. Uh, we checked if these data sources have identifiers of territorial units that uh, the, the data, the statistical data refers to, and uh, we also indicated the update cycle of these uh, data sources. We performed also a preliminary analysis of openness uh, of uh, these sources, uh, uh, taking into account also redundancy of information and popularity. When it comes to statistical units, after NATS 2016 entered into force, we have uh, two kinds of territorial units that we use for publishing statistical data. Administrative division, uh, which are voivodships uh, and uh, units we call powiat and gmina, former law one uh, and former law two. And we also have the nuts, which are macro region, region and sub region. We also have some other non-standard statistical units which are functional areas or urban areas, and these are mainly uh, defined in strategic documents, and those are groups of uh, other uh, territorial units, mainly the administrative ones. Uh, to combine the statistical and administrative division, we have created a classification, we called it KTS. Uh, all the levels of the administrative and territorial units have been combined into one classification and every single unit right now has a 14-digit code. So these are the examples from the country level down to Gmina, which is the lowest administrative division in Poland. All uh, these administrative units we have taken uh, through a harmonization and generalization process. We had administrative boundaries since 2002 for uh, gminas, the, once again, the lowest administrative division. Uh, we standardize the structure, we uh, standardize their identifiers, so they comply with our KTS classification. And after this has been done for the lowest level, we created the upper levels right up to NUTS1. Uh, and uh, also we created two sets of uh, data sets for each year, one of them was uh, data as is, and the other one was generalized for uh, optimized uh, use uh, on the internet. And now the most uh, interesting part, I think, the link to open data pilot itself. Uh, I talked about all types of data we gathered. Uh, in the end, uh, in the pilot, we took statistical data, which were uh, demographic classifications from the three major databases that I talked about earlier. Uh, the statistical units we identified, harmonized, and generalized we used uh, as geospatial data to represent the statistical data. And all data sources that we uh, identified and described with metadata, we put into a data sources catalog, which also was encoded as uh, RDF. Uh, so, as I said, we took uh, some demographic classifications, populations by uh, age, and, uh, age groups and sex from three databases. We defined our own ontology for age using uh, SCOS and Dublin core vocabularies. Uh, we reused the SDMX uh, sex code list, just adding a Polish translation. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and we defined um, uh, metadata for statistical values. Uh, every single value uh, that we encoded was encoded as a data cube observation uh, class. And uh, uh, all, uh, all observations were encoded using mainly SDMX ontologies for attribute, code measure, and dimension. When it comes to geospatial data, uh, our data sample was for 2016 and for voivodships. This is the highest administrative unit uh, we have. Uh, so in the project, we've taken uh, the geometries for voivodships for 2016. Uh, we built an ontology for the KTS classification I told you about earlier, uh, using uh, RDF schema and GeoSpark UL vocabularies, and uh, every geometry was encoded using uh, well-known text, as it is recommended in a GeoSpark UL uh, specification. This is an example of a single uh, geometry of one of the Voivod ships. And uh, the data sources catalog was created using the DCAT application profile for uh, data portals in Europe. Every single data set 
uh, including those that were taken from the database and transformed in this pilot, was encoded as a DCA dataset class. And uh, wherever we could, we used um, other uh, vocabularies, which I think is the principle of linked open data. So for example, uh, for thematic categories, we used Eurovoc, uh, we used the EU Publication Office uh, continent and uh, country code list, and internet media type vocabulary for the format uh, of uh, the data sources. And luckily, it turned out that all the data we taken into the project interlinked between each other. So for example, st statistical data had their geometry reference from geospatial data. All the data sets with uh, statistical data have been uh, put into data set catalog. And uh, geospatial data also uh, was used as a spatial domain for all data sets that were in the catalog. Some technicalities, uh, we have done our data transformation into RDF using CSV as source files. So this is an example of a source file with uh, statistical data. We used uh, Python scripts uh, and the RDF lib module to transform our CSV files to uh, RDF graphs. And uh, Python allowed us to uh, transform the data into graphs and serialize it in any desired format. This is an example of an RDF XML and uh, a bit more human readable format, which is uh, Turtle. So once you have it in Python, you can uh, push it out in any desired format. All our uh, data we have loaded into a single triple store. We used uh, Apache Jena Fusaki as our Spark UL server. We have a a uh, nice looking number of triples, but this is only an accident. Uh, we loaded them all into a single data set to allow cross-querying. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, Apache Nafusaki also has a Sparkle endpoint that allows uh, uh, querying data. So this is a few examples of uh, actual queries uh, performed on uh, our uh, test data set. And, uh, on top of uh, this Spark URL server, we also have established a human readable interface, which is uh, linked to open data frontend. We use uh, Pubby as the software, and this is for, uh, the main page of the statistical uh, data sources catalog. So you can see uh, metadata about uh, the catalog itself, and uh, there is a DCAT dataset reference with 192 datasets for. Uh, each of these, uh, there, are, uh, there are metadata. So this is an example of a, a page for one of the data sets. This is population by sex and age groups from one of the databases with this metadata. This uh, is an example of a single statistical value with all statistical dimensions. So I have a value as a number and every uh, other uh, attribute is a link. And the geometry. On the left, uh, uh, the main classification, KTS. On the right, uh, one of the statistical units, uh, which is one of the Voivod ships. And geometry was encoded as a separate entity, uh, which is seen uh, uh, as the lower image. And finally, I come to conclusions. Uh, and there are a lot of conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> the most important one is that uh, while we were doing the project, uh, we didn't find a reference implementation for statistical linked open data. We found some that were out there, but they lacked integrity. Uh, they were not maintained, and sometimes they, one authority published contradictory data sets or linked to contradictory uh, uh, vocabularies. Uh, we don't uh, yet have uh, pan-European guidelines for statistical linked open data, but that is likely to change because right now uh, the Digicom project run by Eurostat uh, is uh, mm, having an ongoing SSNet uh, linked open data project, which will conclude next year, hopefully with some recommendations. We could use common vocabularies, but uh, most of all, I think, recommended or dedicated software components. And since I'm talking about the software components, uh, most of uh, the ones we have used are not developed anymore. So this is a problem. Uh, we think that Python-based implementations are stable over time. Uh, but uh, uh, Pubby, for example, the front-end uh, I showed you before, is not developed since 2013. 
Another big issue is the semantic harmonization of uh, statistical classifications. For example, we have an age group from 0 to 5. It can be 0 to 5 or 0 to less than 5. Uh, this issue also can uh, exist at uh, country level, not only on uh, European level. When it comes to spatial data, this is a whole different story. Uh, we had different qualities of uh, data for different years, so we published a whole set of geometries for every single year. A good uh, solution would be to publish a single geometry and publish another one only if it changes. We can do that because we don't have data. But, for example, the UK has done it with their linked open uh, geographies published by their statistical office. And the last slide with conclusions. Uh, good and bad news, both. Most linked open data is, uh, implementations are technically correct. That's because you can put anything in an RDF graph. But if you can put anything in an RDF graph, you have to ask yourself if it makes sense. Uh, and uh, a somewhat obvious conclusions, uh, conclusion in the end, uh, we have had to look over lots of uh, RDF specifications and vocabularies. Those that have, have, uh, have had a UML model with them were much easier to interpret. And just a second. <laughs> Apart from being a, a linked open data magician, I'm also a facilitator of uh, statistical cluster at the Inspire thematic clusters. If anybody is interested in talking about Inspire, right after this session, come to the Inspire booth and I'll be there. And hopefully you will be able to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I allow and I hope you agree with me, one question from the audience, if there's any, in that clear, there's one. Okay, my name is Michal Met, I'm from the Czech Republic, and I'm also working quite a bit with uh, linked open data. So I want to ask about, uh, it's uh, quite clear that you are using ETL, extract transform load, uh, and you have, uh, you are transforming all the data at once because you have uh, all the pack in the, uh, in the uh, geosparkle or in the sparkle endpoint. So I'm asking about the uh, uh, actualization of the data. Uh, how often can you, uh, are you updating the data and how much time does it take to update all at once? Okay, so first of all, uh, the data has been produced in parts because there were scripts written for uh, different parts of data. Uh, second, it was only a pilot on a small uh, data sample, uh, so it was published internally and it was not updated. It was just an exercise for us to uh, learn step by step what to do to publish linked open data. So um, I cannot give you any answers on how uh, it would uh, work with a whole database. Uh, so, my name is Tuula Vihlema, uh, I work in Statistics Finland, and I'm going to talk about a project uh, called Integration of Geographies and Area Classifications as Linked to Open Data, IGALOT. Um, so, first of all, what is IGALOT? Uh, <coughs> it's a two-year cooperational project between uh, Statistics Finland and National Land Survey of Finland. Uh, partly funded by Eurostat grant program. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, and the idea is that we want to link the area classifications and the corresponding geographies to publish them as linked open data, uh, utilize them in a statistical production process, and use them to create interactive map applications. Um, expected outcomes from the project. Uh, we will have an uh, identifier system and identifiers and also required ontologies for the geographies and uh, classifications. Uh, we will have a RDF-based solution, including the architecture description. We will be piloting the linked open data dissemination and we also will be piloting interactive map applications. Um, and the last one is a pilot about 
cross-organizational production process for geospatial information, utilizing the linked data, and also um, report about the results for further development. Uh, and the big picture why we are doing this, we would like to link the GSIM statistical area classifications and the corresponding geographies uh, in, as for example, maybe you can see something, the population statistics and the geo statistics, the geospatial data warehouse, they would be created a uh, link using the metadata warehouse systematically. Um, so what about, what's this for INSPIRE? Uh, both organizations, we are a public sector INSPIRE data providers, and are, uh, in our case, the uh, data is partially overlapping for administrative units and statistical units, and the base geospatial data have the origin in the uh, National Mapping Agency. So the idea is to test a uh, common production process and, and dissemination platform based on the Sparkle endpoints. And as a result, this in the end, we would have less overlapping in our processes and more fluent access to data for customers. Um, other expected outcomes for Inspire implementation. Uh, for mapping agency, this uh, would result that their uh, data would be connected to the statistical area classifications. Uh, so in their data, both statistical and geospatial standards would be considered. Um, another thing, when we're using the unique and accessible identifiers, we would be avoiding overlapping of data production and data duplication. Um, organizations would have own URI services and Sparkle endpoints to provide data in machine-readable format. And for uh, Statistics Finland, at least for our INSPIRE implementation, we find that this uh, we can have the identifiers that will actually go in line with our organization own needs. Uh, so something about the RDF. Uh, it's uh, acronym for resource, resource description framework. Uh, it's a abstract data model that can work on top on different syntaxes and different databases, and the information will be expressed on sentences with three parts. And typically, each part of the sentence have their own URI, uh, and the the RDF graph differs from other data models, because here in RDF graph you have all relations possible and, and uh, like I said, the meanings are expressed as sentences and it's good for uh, linked data and networks. So basically it's good for providing metadata in machine readable format and that's why we use it. Uh, something about the standards. Uh, for the RDF of classifications, uh, we've tested the uh, ExCOS ex vocabulary. Uh, it is extension of ESCOS for representing the statistical classifications. And on the geographies side, uh, in, in the project we used the INSPAR administrative units ontology and Geosparkle ontology and some own non-standardized concepts. Uh, so far, about the results, we've selected the uh, classifications and geographies. Uh, the, we've selected the municipality-based statistical units and uh, NUTS and LAUG uh, classifications. Uh, we have a draft for the uh, mapping architecture of the common production process. We have some preliminary plans for the identifier service in Statistics Finland. And we had this idea of a so-called fast track, which is for testing the solutions and tools, since this is a, a two-year project, and we want to see the uh, 
uh, if we are on the <laughs> right track. So it's uh, it's for testing the the solutions. Um, more about that later. But first about the mapping architecture. This is just a draft now. So the idea would be that we would have uh, the geographies transformed to RDF format, and then we would have uh, also the area classifications transformed, and there would be uh, two uh, data banks, and between them we would create a link between the municipalities and the classifications. Uh, and based on this, we could provide the uh, the data from uh, two separate Sparkle endpoints. Um, and based on these endpoints, they, we could have these services, like for customers, a, a graphical user interface, where they could be the aerial divisions and statistics visualized, and then uh, also other data products for, uh, for example, downloading in multiple data formats. Uh, and the, there is still a question mark around the stat statistical part here, because we're actually not sure if it's uh, if it's sm smart to transform the data in this part of the process to RDF, or maybe it should be uh, some other uh, solution. Uh, but for anyway testing purposes, we can uh, do some uh, transformation for some selected data. And then uh, about the fast track, so th this is a kind of a proof of concept for uh, piloting the ontologies and the RDF transformations, and also the uh, the whole architecture how we uh, figure it out. And, and also to see the end visualization service, how it would work in the whole process. So uh, we will have uh, two uh, Yena Fuseki ser service servers for the database and Sparkle endpoints. And uh, for the visualization, we don't yet have our own uh, uh, service, but for this testing purposes, there are options like Yaskui, it's it's uh, sufficient here for this purpose. Um, and some observations about uh, combining these worlds, we, we noticed that there's like a work to do still with the terminology between geographical and statistical world. You, when you have like different terms for same things or same terms, but they're uh, not quite the same thing. And uh, also, uh, as mentioned here, the lack of linked data references when it comes to combining statistics and geographies. And and uh, but the good thing is we we feel that when we're, we're working between two organizations, we we can when we combine the knowledge, we we can get better results. And then uh, it's uh, both organizations will gain something from the project. So this is the uh, last slide. We will, our future plans, we will, uh, like I said, we'll be testing the fast, fast track architecture. Uh, and then we need to evaluate the uh, RDF vocabulary standards used. Uh, and this includes a um, study visit to INSEE in uh, France, the French Statistics Institute, uh, because they've been progressive on this uh, matter. And also we need to evaluate the, the, the whole model uh, in reflected to the statistics production process, both utilizing the Sparkle endpoints for the, for the statistical units and then the the evaluation against the GSBPM model. And uh, we will uh, make uh, plans for the technical implementation of the RDF databases and visualization platform. 
Okay, thank you. So thank you, thank you all for staying with long. I we have one question for Tuli. I already see a raising hand there. Yes, thank you. That was a very interesting um, uh, presentation. My name is Hans. I'm uh, with. Oracle Corporation, uh, and I was just wondering, you were mentioning that you had problems finding references linking geospatial data uh, and statistical information in sort of other projects around Europe, and uh, I was curious whether you've been looking at work we've been doing, for example, with Istat in, in Italy, uh, which is relatively well documented also in the literature, uh, or work we've done with um, Ordnance Survey Ireland. Uh, mm. together with Trinity College yeah. and uh, the Central Statistics Office, who, who I believe are also coming to Helsinki yeah. next month yeah. uh, for the uh, event in, uh, uh, on geo, um, geodata, the EF, uh, EFT, EFTS, correct, yes. Yeah, so have I you think been looking into those two, two projects? Uh, well, uh, yeah, Ireland, yes, but I think we are like still uh, uh, in the middle of uh, this like uh, researching thing for this. Okay, but, I'll be, I'll but, be happy but, to. but but like uh, yes, uh, still like uh, some yes, but we will yeah we'll look more into detail with them. Okay, I mean okay. I'll be happy to introduce you to the guys in, in Italy yeah. as well, for example. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.